Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, those creatures that you might not know um, what they are, are mostly birds. So um, uh, people <laughs> like to joke that I work with the birds and the bees, and that's literally true. Um, so I'll try and share my screen now. It might take just a little bit of time, um, just because I've got two screens and the loading up takes a little longer than normal. So, does that seem all right? If someone can give me a thumbs up, brilliant. Um, so um, thank you very much, uh, Arosha, for this invitation to, to come and have a chat and a discussion with you. Um, it's lovely to meet the global Arosha family, some of whom I know and some of whom I'm meeting virtually for the first time. Um, so I've been sort of dipping in and out of the forum over the last couple of days, listening to Simon's talk and then Catherine's talks. And I must say, they're both very hard acts to follow. Uh, but the one thing that gives me uh, a great deal of hope is that we all have a common interest in tackling these big problems. And for the most part, we agree on the big issues. So today, I'd like to talk a little bit about this really fine balancing line that we are trying to walk on in terms of biodiversity conservation and food security. And I often find myself losing my balance on this line. And, and therefore, I thought um, we could have a discussion about this. Um, we all work in conservation. We are familiar with these figures. They don't make for happy reading. We find ourselves in the Anthropocene in the sixth mass age of extinction. Since 1500, at least 680 vertebrates have been confirmed or likely to have gone extinct. And this is even before we start looking at the plants and invertebrates uh, species that we might have lost in that time. So let's hope this works. Yes, it does. So um, we all know that the common denominator of this biodiversity loss is us humans and our activities. I mean, you, if you want to break it down, it's how we've destroyed our habitat. It's how we've exploited organisms. Um, there is always the issue of climate change and that's been driven by anthrop um, human activities. Um, but also all our activities have led to pollution on both land and on sea. And this has also led to the movement and arrival of many invasive alien species that then outcompete native species. So a recent study um, in Nature showed how 75% of the Earth's land surface has been altered by us humans within the last millennia. And this study, while really, really significant, doesn't really sort of even scratch the surface on what we've done to our oceans and seas and rivers and lakes. Um, according to 2017 figures, so I assume this is slightly out of date already, we are now using up 173% of Earth's resources. So we are using up more resources than the Earth can physically replenish. And this is a real problem because much of the blame for this land management has been laid at the door of our agricultural practices particularly on where and how we produce our food. So there's a huge debate raging on what we should and shouldn't eat and how much of which food groups we should have. Um, but there's also a lot of controversy over the carbon footprint of um, specific production of specific food types. Now, I don't know about you, but I love chocolate. I'm, I'm a self-confessed chocoholic um, and I very rarely eat any red meat at all but I recently found out that my consumption of chocolate could actually be more detrimental to the environment than if I were eating low impact produced beef. So these are sort of statistics that are thrown at us and we're overwhelmed by these numbers. And, and sometimes it's very difficult to, to sort of decide where you fit into this picture and what choices that we as individuals can make. 
Now, while all of these debates rage on about sustainable food production, that is just one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is about healthy diets and whether people actually have access to healthy food and whether they can afford it. Now, anytime we talk about lack of nutrition or lack of healthy diets, we immediately think of the poorer countries of the world, the developing world. But actually, the developed economies are also struggling with this problem. So it may surprise you to know that in the UK, according to current figures, 1.96 million people are undernourished, 3 million are malnourished, and 14% of UK families have experienced food insecurity in the last six months. And that's one small tiny island in, in the entire global um, um, picture. And quite a bit of our problem stem from the fact that if you look at the food pyramid of what constitutes a healthy diet, it's almost exactly inversely proportionate to the environmental impact pyramid that says, this is the impact of producing this food. So um, we have this sort of tussle between our food security and protecting our environment. And all of this is before we've even sort of started talking about the livelihoods of farmers in this context. So how do we balance this biodiversity conservation with our need for food security? Um, for a very long time, biodiversity conservation was, was its own silo. We, we looked at species, communities, populations. We did our best to manage them in the context in which they were found. However, it's becoming more and more apparent that these problems of biodiversity loss and land management and climate change and throw in COVID as well, and they're all irrevocably linked with each other. And, and in order to tackle one problem, we need to try and find holistic solutions that won't then have a detrimental impact on another aspect. So Catherine, uh, when she was doing her talk on what gives us hope, um, talked about the importance of sharing stories. So I've gone with this in the hope that I can share three stories with you today. Uh, two of them are from my own experience, and one of them is uh, from the Arosha family. Um, and I'm hoping that by sort of talking through these stories, we might sort of get an idea of the, the scale of the problems we face, but also um, try and find if there are solutions that we could live with. So this is quite familiar, I think, to most people. Um, anyone who's heard about how important pollinators and particularly bees are to our food production knows about the problem faced by pollinators in terms of pesticides. So in the last few years, this issue has come to the fore and there's a particular group of pesticides called neonicotinoids, which have been banned across Europe because they have a detrimental impact on bee populations, both um, in terms of they have lethal effects, but they also have what we call sublethal effects. So they might not kill the bees, but they disorient them enough that they can't find their way back home. Um, so the neonic ban was a good thing. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, but the farmers, when I go and talk to them, they do not have a problem with the ban on neonicotinoids they have a problem with the fact that they haven't been given a viable alternative. So most of them in the face of this ban have reverted to using what they call broad spectrum chemicals. And these don't impact bees as badly, but they do affect a whole wide spectrum of biodiversity. So at this point, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of a decision maker in this context. And I'm hoping Erin can do some whizzy stuff and pop up a, a poll in, in, in the chat. And I would like you to vote in this poll and let me know whether you would choose to ban specific chemicals that affect pollinators or ban all chemicals altogether.
if everybody can vote, um, I hasten to add no right or wrong answers. This is just to see where we are, where we find ourselves in the spectrum of making decisions and choices. And when we've all voted, Erin, would you be happy to share the results as well? Yes, of course. We're just a few more people left to vote. Okay. Um, I tried to do Catherine's whizzy thing of incorporating the poll into my presentation, but it wouldn't work. So <laughs> thank you, Erin, for, for helping me with technology. I think it's possible that not everybody will be able to vote if people have joined on phones or so we're at a 92% voter turnout. So I'm going to end polling there. Um, and I should be able to share the results with everybody on your screens. And we will see that 27 people voted to ban specific chemicals that affect certain species, which was 63% and 16 people or 37% of us voted to ban all pesticides altogether. So, so that's quite an interesting split, um, you know, so we've got a two thirds of let's let's go for the really specific targeted approach. And then there's one third of people who say let's ban um, chemicals. That's actually a surprise to me because normally when when you ask conservation biologists, they're, they're quite usually on the sort of fully organic part of the spectrum. But whether you choose to ban um, specific chemicals or whether you choose to ban all pesticides, there's still a problem. So from a farmer's perspective and from a food security perspective, non-application of what they call essential chemicals um, can lead to losses in yields. So the FAO estimates that up to 40% of global crop yields are reduced each year due to damage caused by pests. Now a 40% reduction in yield is not sustainable for farmers. Um, and especially if you're trying to, to feed almost 8 billion people, um, rising to 9 billion people by 2050. Um, we still, we, we are in this state where we need to produce more food, not less. So what can we do about it? One of the options that scientists are talking about and farmers are beginning to warm up to is this integrated pest management. So this is letting nature take care of nature. Um, and, and by creating an environment around fields and farms where you can have natural enemies of pests that feed on them, um, farmers can sort of introduce a form of biological control that can help them reduce their chemical input. Now this way, um, this method has a long way to go because it's only slowly coming to the fore, um, but it just reinforces my belief that nature was designed to be in balance and by actually letting it do its own thing, we might find more solutions to the problems that we've created. However, to let nature do its own thing, there needs to be space for nature. So across Europe and North America, there are incentives and subsidies for farmers to take land out of production, put in things like wildflower strips, um, reduce their cutting of hedgerows, reduce their mowing frequency, basically let the natural environment thrive so you could bring in beneficial insects, whether that's for pollination or pest regulation. However, all of this comes at a cost. So even when there are subsidies, even when there are financial incentives, it takes about three to four years for the farmers to break even. So the first three to four years, they experience a loss in profit. Um, there, there is a huge financial gain later on, but that's only after year four or five that they start beginning to reap the benefits of the efforts they've put in. Now, so this might work really well in, in a developed context where there are farmers subsidies, where there's a level of financial security for farmers to be able to bridge that sort of loss in profit. But if you're in the developing world and you are a smallholder farmer who's living a hand to mouth existence, how do you tell them that they are going to be at a loss for three to four years before they start reaping the benefits? So we need to find context specific solutions. So this is a current project we've got in South India, in Tamil Nadu, and we're trying to introduce the same concept of can we recreate or um, put in interventions that will attract pollinators, but also natural enemies. 
Now we designed this with the farmers. They're really enthusiastic. They're very environmentally friendly. They, but without financial incentives, uh, the first thing they said to me was no wildflowers. No, you know, we, we don't have the water resources or the financial resources to try and put that in. But what they were happy to do was to intercrop. So they said, if you can give me a solution, that means I can have a secondary source of income or something that would provide food for my families. I'm happy to do it. So we then went with marigolds, which have a high market value. So we put in strips of marigold in between these moringa fields. Uh, but we also did some natural pest management. So organic um, solutions that were made up at home that were hung on trees that would attract pests into them. But also these, um, we had red gram around the fields that attracted natural enemies. Now, <laughs> I'm happy to say, our pest control worked, but our pollinator control didn't because Moringa is a drought resistant crop and marigold isn't. So our floral interventions all dried up and failed this year. Um, so this to me is, is a learning experience. Um, the farmers are still willing to try other attempts, but you might not get it right on the first go. Doesn't mean we're going to quit but it's trying to find these context specific solutions and that's not just sort of what works in Europe doesn't work in, in South Asia, but you know, what works for one crop might not work for another and what works in one district might not work in another. So it's, it's keeping that awareness in mind. So moving on to story two, and I put my hand up now and say, the marine environment is not my area of expertise. And there are probably lots of people in this forum who are far more experienced than I to talk about it. But I just wanted to highlight that this problem that we have of unsustainably producing food also leads to problems in the marine environment. There's land runoff and agricultural waste, and that's leading to organic and chemical pollution. And it's affecting the food chain. It's affecting whole ecosystems. It's impacting human health. And there's also marine dead zones along the coast, like the, the red bit that you can see on this map here. And that is before we talk about food security leading to overfishing. Now, fish is a vital source of food for a lot of people. Um, when I was looking up the statistics on this, I found out that actually 16% of animal protein that's consumed all over the world is, is um, attributed to fish. And also fish provides omega-3 fatty acids for healthy diets. But overfishing and deep sea trawling damages seabeds so badly and, and it does truncate the food web and, and destroy the environment. So marine protected areas are touted as these solutions. So um, there, there are lots of benefits to marine protected areas. They, they do protect essential habitats, they protect vulnerable ecosystems, and, and they are safe havens for, for fish to uh, thrive and reproduce. Um, and also it protects the, the, the area from overfishing and trawling. However, these also come at a cost. So having marine protected areas of MPAs just mean that these areas are excluded from fishing activities, which could affect the livelihoods of local fishing communities. So no take reserves um, not only exclude fishing from these communities, but could also, in theory, cause overfishing just outside of the boundaries of these MPAs. Um, sorry, not really sure what happened there. I'm trying to get rid of that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Arusha, Kenya, my apologies if I don't get all the details right, but I think you've done a fantastic Deepa, sorry, it seems that you're, you somehow, it's typing whatever you're speaking now. <laughs> Has it stopped or? Yes. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay, so hopefully it stopped typing while I'm speaking. Uh, but I was just about to say, so, so Arusha Kenya has done some amazing work with marine protected areas. And I, and I from what I hear and, and the stories that Bob tells me, 
Um, this is to do with communication and co-design with local communities. Because top-down policy implementation of marine protected areas is not always welcomed by the local communities because they feel disenfranchised and affected. Whereas if you involve them in the communication and co-design and they feel invested in this, um, there is a big benefit. So some studies suggest that within one to three years, there's rapid recovery of fish populations. Um, and in Kenya, apparently it took just over 20 years for the coral reefs to start coming back. Um, so it's also, it means that the, the big fish within these MPAs can move out of these areas, which actually means there's better catch outside, just outside of the marine protected areas. And, and fisher, commu fisher communities have found that there's actually an increase in their sort of per capita income of over 130%. So marine protected areas might not solve the problem completely, but there's enough evidence to show that they could benefit both biodiversity and livelihoods. So anyway, moving back to terra firma, which is where I'm most comfortable. Um, and this is a story from India. And this was one of my earliest experiences in conservation. So this bird that you see here is the Jordan's Corsa. It's one of the most critically endangered bird species in the world. It's nocturnal, it's very hard to find. And in my 20 plus years of working in conservation, I've never laid eyes on it. I've only seen photographs that the bird has taken of itself using infrared tripwire photography. But the, the conservation angle on this is that the entire world population of this bird is found in the state of Andhra Pradesh in India in a very small district in a very small scrub jungle. So this bird was thought to be extinct for 86 years until it was rediscovered. And this is the last remaining known habitat of this bird. So this is what the habitat looks like. So it's scrub jungle with a little bit, a combination of bare ground and, and sort of a diverse scrub habitat. Now this habitat is under huge amount of threat. So there's slash and burn agriculture going on. And even though this is a protected area status, um, there's encroachment happening. But more important than that, the habitat of this bird was severely fragmented by irrigation canals taking water to the rice fields. And now this is one of the most drought prone areas in India. So without these irrigation canals, the crops tend to fail. However, is this enough justification to destroy and fragment the last remaining known habitat of this bird? But like every story, this is only one side of it. The other side is that this, this area is so drought prone, the farmers have regularly, and I mean this regularly, it's not a one-off, it's not one year. Farmers in this region commit mass suicide because they cannot feed their families. Now, this is an extreme case example, and I give you that, but, but we find ourselves faced with these dilemmas. So, so we have the survival of this species. This is the last remaining known habitat of this species and we have human lives hanging in the balance. So I'm launching my second poll now, um, and I would like you to vote again on whether you would choose to save the species and its habitat, or whether you prioritize human lives. Thanks, Erin. Again, I would, I would hasten to add no right or wrong answers because people have to make these decisions every day. And um, so go with what, what you think is best. How are we doing, Erin, in terms of responses? Um, I think lots of people abstaining from this question were at 70 percent, um, so 33 of 47 have voted. Um, and at the moment, I'm going to end polling, I think, because that number hasn't changed for the last 10 seconds. And you will see when I share the results 
that 42% voted to save the journey's course of species, whereas 58% voted for option B, which was save human lives. That and is several, several votes in the chat for option C, both and please. Okay. <laughs> um, I think both would be the ideal solution. And, and I agree with that. And, and you'll see in a minute why I agree with that. But I just wanted to give you this binary choice because these sort of binary choices happen and, and people are having to make those choices. And sometimes just saying, oh, let's go off and find a win-win solution. We don't have the time or the resources to find those win-win solutions and you have to make these choices. Um, anyway, the good news in this, in this situation was after a very long time and lots of discussion between lots of people, so there was agricultural officials, forest officials, conservation biologists and, and local politics um, involved in all of this, um, everybody decided to contribute a little bit to the pot of money and reroute the irrigation canals. So the, the scrub habitat wouldn't be fragmented, but there would still be um, water getting to the fields. Um, but to be fair, this took about 10 years from the time I went out as a master student to get this accomplished. So, so it does take a really long time to get these win-win solutions. And sometimes you don't get the opportunity or the freedom to make those choices and you have to make, so, so politicians quite often, not politicians, sorry, policymakers that I talk to um, always have to make decisions on an immediate basis based on the evidence that they have provided to them at that particular point in time. And then five years down the line, that's quite often not the right decision for, for a long-term goal. But, but it is something that I've learned in the last few years that the evidence base and decision-making go hand in hand and it's not always easy. So my final sort of, um, thought, I think, is, is how our perspectives might um, influence our motives. So in my research career, I'm sort of immersed in the world of ecosystem services. Now, this is a phrase that's absolutely loathed by conservation biologists, because it doesn't give value to the, the intrinsic, it doesn't consider the intrinsic value of biodiversity, but only thinks of biodiversity as what it can provide for human health and well-being. Now, I put up my hand and I say this is a very, very limited argument, but I also realize that if you are talking to people who are not as entrenched in conservation biology um, and decision makers such as policy or even big business, the ecosystem services argument is, is a gentle opener in saying, Look, biodiversity gives us so much. Here are the things that we get a benefit from biodiversity and then move the argument and the discussion on to the wider intrinsic value of biodiversity. So I would just request you all as fellow conservation biologists not to dismiss the ecosystem services argument out of hand, but perhaps then starting there and then extend it to the ecosystem function how everything in nature was designed, was created to be in balance. Um, and, you know, taking one thing out of balance means that the whole system can collapse. So I think there is, the, there is value for the services argument as a starting point, but going beyond that to the function and the intrinsic value of biodiversity is really important. So what drives us and what do we value most? Are we in conservation? Because we really want to save charismatic, iconic species that you know we want future generations to, to love and adore as much as we do. Um, are we in conservation? Because we want nature to be in balance and we are particularly focused on species and communities that provide a service or function. Um, does food security motivate us? Does na finding nature-based solutions and ensuring food security motivate us? Does financial security motivate us? And I'm not saying this is a bad thing. Everybody wants their families to be safe and not go hungry and have food, clothing and shelter. So, but, but I suspect that for all of us, that it's a combination of all of these things that, that drive us. But beyond that, as a Russia family, I want to ask if truly beyond all of this, our faith and our mission as stewards of creation drives 
what we do. So I'll end with this because I, I really, really think that what motivates and what drives us and, and what we believe in, in terms of our faith and our future and hope eternal makes a difference to our actions in the present day. So think about what is your reason and what is your passion for doing it? Because your reason and your passion give you direction and drive. And hopefully by considering those things, we will be able to make those choices in a context specific way that will help further our work and God's work on earth. Thank you.